everybody, my name is Jens Larsen. When it comes to bebop phrasing and jazz blues, then I think Josh Benson is in the top five for most of us. And I'm sure that if you're clicking on this video, you're also interested in checking out how he's playing. The solo that I'm going to talk about in this video is, as far as I'm concerned, probably the best jazz blues solo that I know, or at least one of the best ones. And I think his lines on this blues and F are completely mind blowing. Some of the things I'm going to talk about when I'm analyzing this solo is uh, how he's mixing jazz and bebop phrases in his lines, and also just keeping both the, both of them in there in one line. Uh, his favorite arpeggio, which is quite clear on this blues, and also how he's really making great lines with really basic material. He's just very good at it. And then finally, I'm also going to talk a little bit about what makes his lines great and how he manages to come up with lines that are more interesting than a lot of other jazz lines that you come across. A thing that I'm gonna throw in there as sort of a bonus feature is also that he has one approach to creating lines that he's using, especially one place in the form. That's a different approach than what you see in most places and you wanna check out how to do that because that gives you a few advantages when you're trying to come up with some new material. If you wanna learn more about jazz guitar, improve the way that you solo, check out some interesting arpeggios or chord voicings, then subscribe to my channel. If you wanna make sure not to miss anything, then click the little bell notification icon next to the subscribe button. This solo is from George Benson's recording of Billy's Bounce, and it was the first track and the first solo on the first CD that I ever got with George Benson, just when I was getting into jazz. And I was immediately sold on how he was playing on it and trying to figure it out. And in the beginning, that was way too difficult. I didn't really get anywhere with it. Uh, but I've kept coming back on it and I'm actually still wondering how exactly he's playing some of the phrases. I'm also still really enjoying the solo, so it's kind of fun to just return to it and try and see if you can figure out a little bit more, which is a great way to check out solos, I think. I thought this would be a good phrase to start with because this phrase actually baffled me for hours and hours. And I think it's a great example of how he's really mixing some Bob language and some blues language. And it's also quite early in the solo. So what we have here is that he's starting on the C7 at the end of the chorus. So the first thing we have is really just a B flat. It's kind of like a B flat major nine arpeggio on top of the C7, playing with a sweep here, sliding into the uh, A up to the C and then encircling the B flat. And then immediately when he's resolving to the F7, he's going into this blues phrase, which is really sort of a, um, double stop idea where we have the sustained D on top and then the G and the A flat and the F under it. It's a little bit like playing Dorian on top of an F7 actually. And uh, this is something I'm not, I mean, I can't know for sure, of course, but I would imagine that he's taken this uh, from Wes or he's learned at the same place as Wes. That's of course also possible because there is a part of no blues of smoking out the half note where Wes is using this exact phrase for a whole chorus. That's probably where this is coming from. And then from there, going into just a basic F major phrase, which is first the B flat down to the F and then uh, really up the, the minor, so the major pentatonic scale. So first we have sort of a minor blues and then we get a major blues phrase where we get first the, the third, fifth, sixth and the root. I'm curious if you have another way of playing this line, because I think every time I return to this solo, I come up with a new way of playing it. And I think this is the fifth one that I've come up with. So if you have a better solution, then leave a comment on this video. This example is also centered around the final two five in the progression. Uh, and we come in, so sort of in, in a pickup to, to the A half diminished uh, D7 to G minor. The pickup is a bit odd actually, uh, because it's a G minor triad, which is on the F7. I think the idea, if you have to explain this, is probably that he's playing sort of F7, G minor, and then up to the A half diminished. It is a little bit on the vague side, side and it's also a bit of a stretch to analyze it like that even though that, that would kind of make sense. The only thing that's, pro the problem with that is that he's not really playing the A half diminished chord. So we have the G minor second inversion as, a, as an upbeat. And then on the A half diminished, we get D and F that are really just encircling the E flat. And the line here is really just D7 altered. 
like this. And then on the last uh, part of the D7 bar, we get this, which is really just two notes that are approach notes to the third of, of G minor, so A and C. And then another leading note, C sharp, resolving up to the fifth of, of G minor. And then another approach, uh, which is A and F sharp to go to the root to G. And then D and F taking us to the third of C7. And then the arpeggio from the third of the C7, which is E half diminished. Down to the root, skipping down to the third. And then up to the seventh. And then resolving to the A on F7. And then actually he's not playing F7 here, he's playing F major 7 because he plays the A and then a C major, a triad, resolving to F and then down to C. So what's going on here is the first part, the D7 is just D7 altered, nothing really strange happening here. Then what's happening on the G minor, so I would consider that already from the last part of the D7, so All of this is really just using leading notes. So it's basically, he's looking at the G minor seven as being a G minor triad, and then he's using leading notes uh, to the different chord tones in there. And in that way, not really thinking about the scale. Now, one sort of advantage to this is that that means that you're sort of skipping around in the chord and you're gonna get some melodies that are jumping around a lot more and getting and some interesting intervals happening while you're still making sense because you're always going to a chord tone. And that's really a huge part of what makes these lines work. And, work. and I think it's also a huge part of why he is getting away with creating lines that, that we really find more interesting than, or above average interesting. So because he's thinking in terms of just basic triad chord tones, so in this case like G, B flat and D, and then some leading notes, then he can skip around and still get everything to make sense because he's going to those chord tones. So if I play the line from the G minor seven, so we're starting on, we're starting on the B flat, so, and then he's skipping all the way down to a C sharp, but that's just because he wants to get to the D. So, and then we get two notes going to the root, and then he's encircling the third of the C seven. And that way he's on the G minor, he's actually using the G minor triad notes, and then also F sharp, F and C sharp, so in that way he's also introducing some notes that are really surprising and kind of strong because they're chromatic leading notes. So we have the... This line, and you can hear that it's just moving around and making some skips that we don't expect, and that's what makes it interesting, because it's not random intervals, uh, so they still make sense to us, but they're not what we expect. It's not just a line that's moving from A to B in a predictable way and that makes it more interesting to listen to. So if we focus on the G minor seven, uh, if I take a G minor triad arpeggio like this, then I can add all the leading notes to that one, like. And that's what he's using here. And that's also what you see already in this example. If I take another example uh, from the solo that sounds like this. Same place in the song. Uh, a minor, D7 to G minor. First, he's really playing A minor, so the, the triad down to the third, clearly D7. And then we're on the G minor with the B flat, encircling. So that's already a part of the line. And then we get an approach to the third of C7. And then skipping around the C7 arpeggio. And then a leading note down to the seventh up to the ninth of the chord. And another place in the solo a little bit later. So here we have really just a line that's very clearly messing around with the target notes here for, for, the, for the B flat on the, the third of the G minor. And then long road to the G, which is the root of the G minor, of course, or in this case, he's actually not resolving it until he's on the C7, but here's a chord tone as well, because it's the fifth. 
And then we get again the D and the F to take us to the third of the C7, where he's playing the, the E half diminished the pitch, so the half diminished the pitch from the third of the dominant. And then a chromatic run down to the third of F. So he's very clearly using this way of thinking about a basic chord and then some leading notes. And he's not really thinking about a scale. The exercise of playing these chromatic leading notes and these enclosures around chord tones is pretty common. But this way of thinking is actually not something you're gonna see really often in solos. And it is something worth exploring and you actually have sort of a bonus because it helps you get more interesting lines in terms of having all these interval skips around and just get that to all make sense in a nice musical way. The other thing that's also becoming kind of clear and that you'll also see in the next example is that whenever he has a dominant chord, so in this case the C7, he's using the arpeggio from the third and he uses that a lot, really a lot in the solos. This is not, these are not the only examples where that happens on the C7, but we have this arpeggio returning again and again as part of uh, his lines on the C7. So that's probably his favorite arpeggio when it comes to dominant chords. Since this is about my favorite jazz blues solo, then I'm also kind of curious, what is your favorite solo? Because maybe there's a great solo that I missed and maybe there's something I should be making a video on. So leave a comment with your favorite jazz blues solo. The reason that I can keep on publishing videos every week is that I have a community of people over on Patreon that are supporting the channel. I'm very grateful for their support and it's because of them that I can keep on making all these very specific jazz guitar and music theory videos. If you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. And if you join us over on Patreon, I can also give you something in return for your support. This example I think really illustrates well how he's using blues but really using also jazz blues in a little bit more of a sophisticated way. And also there are a few nice phrasing tricks and some really great melodies. The first part of the phrase is just also leading into the first bar of the form. And it's really just the blues cliche when it comes to jazz blues, which is first the 13th or the sixth, and then up to the root. And then we get this long row of chromatic movement from the minor third up to the fifth. And then he's ending that with a typical bebop by just a bebop down to the root here. Then we get a sort of a, this works actually like a chord response thing because he's somehow answering this on the next chord, which is the B flat seven, by playing the inverse of that interval. So and then really just down an F minor blue scale. So and then encircling third, the major third of the F7, and using the arpeggio from the third of the F7, which is the A half diminished. So again, the his favorite arpeggio on a dominant chord. Resolving to the root, and then skipping down to the third, introducing a large interval again. And then here, he's actually resolving to the B flat seven already on the three. So it's, it's a little bit anticipating the B flat seven. And uh, a really nice thing that he does here is that he's sliding back and forth to just add some motion to that note up to the fifth. And then on the one, he's on the root, sliding up to the third again. And then we get another example of where he's using chord tones and uh, so basic chord tones on the B flat seven and then some leading notes. So First the chord tones, B flat, the root, the fifth, and then we get four and the leading note to the third. And then further down the, the triad, so root and fifth. And then the next phrase that's already started now, so is this. And really what that is, is on the B flat seven, he's using sort of this melody from the fifth of the chord, which is just a straight F minor cliche line really, but he's, he's switching around the notes in a nice way. So first we get the A flat, skipping up to the fifth, to the C of that. So uh, now I'm thinking in F minor, so it's A flat, C, and then down to the G and then the F, and then resolving that to the A on the F7. 
So, so again, we have a line that's not moving in a, in a sort of straight line to the next chord. It's really moving around and adding some surprising intervals. If you want to check out another video where I'm analyzing some George Benson phrases and also going over how you can introduce some similar ideas into your own playing, then check out this video where I'm going over some phrases from his solo on All The Things You Are. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar and it's the first time you see one of my videos, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. That's about it for this time. Thank you for watching and until next time.